Think about that a little longer. Well, good morning to you. We're in the book of Job this morning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Job. <laughs> Anybody in here feel like Job sometimes? Oh, yeah. oh, there's a lot of Job in here. Okay, well, this sermon is dedicated to you folks that raised your hand. Today, I've, I, I love the language. I love the English language and, and how it says some things sometimes. And today, this in the book of Job chapter 2 today, I have found uh, some of the most poetic language I've ever heard in it. When I read it, it's just like looking at a picture. I mean, it just paints a beautiful picture. And these are, and it's called Sitting Among the Ashes. And that's where we're going to find Job today. Sitting Among the Ashes. And if you ever felt like you were sitting among the ashes, and Job was sitting there scraping his boils with a broken piece of pottery. And uh, what a beautiful, horrible picture that paints of sometimes life can get really difficult. And I know many of you have experienced that. And uh, the truth of it is, if you haven't, you may yet. And so we are all in that situation of some time or another sitting among the ashes. Now this story of Job has been told over and over again for thousands and thousands of years. It is one of those well-worn stories that's been told so many times that when you read it, all the rough edges have been knocked off of it. I mean, it, it's smooth, it's well-crafted. well, well crafted. It, it comes to us uh, really communicating the deep human emotions that we feel from time to time. Uh, it says it very clearly. Uh, it teaches us about the human heart and about issues that we deal with as human beings. Now, I think it tries to answer some of the hardest questions on earth that we ever going to have to deal with. I think Job attempts to answer them, and in fact, may clearly answer them. But I know from time to time we ask ourselves, uh, is pain good or is pain bad? And Job's going to be dealing with that. Is it, is it really a good thing to have all this pain or is it a bad thing? And I don't know, I don't know what you think about it right now, uh, but there are times... I don't like pain because it hurts. You know what I'm saying? It just, it. Uh, whenever my back was uh, broken last summer, uh, I know the doctor gave me some awful good pain medications that uh, really made made it feel a lot better. And and I, I didn't hesitate to use them when I needed them. Uh, but the truth is, pain is not bad. It's good. Now I'm going to tell you why I think pain is good, and I think you'll agree with me. But if imagine not being able to feel pain at all having no, no sensation in your fingers to know when, something, when you were touching something. Uh, no, no pain in your body anywhere. Nothing. Cut your finger off. Nothing. Wouldn't, know, wouldn't care at all. Imagine living life without any pain whatsoever. Now before we go, let me tell you, that's what leprosy does to people in the third world countries. Is leprosy reduces or eliminates the pain in your, or the feeling in your extremities. You can't feel anything. In your toes, your nose, your ears, your lips, uh, your, your you know, hands, whatever. You can't feel anything. And you go through life uh, without sensation. Now, you think, well, that would be good. Except, think about this. What if you stepped on a coal at a campfire and burned a, burned a big hole in your foot? You wouldn't even know it. And you'd go for days before you ever looked at the bottom of your foot. Wondering, what, why is my foot swelling up? And my, why do I have fever? And you wouldn't know what caused it. Or imagine you were running down the road and you broke your ankle. And you just kept running. Because well, you wouldn't feel it. You see, that's, that's part of living with, without any sensation whatsoever. I'm going to get a little gross now. But imagine sleeping in a third world setting and a rat chews your nose or your ears while you're sleeping. You ever wonder why people with, with leprosy have no fingers? And no toes or ears or nose because they lose them. Things eat them. They bite them off and they burn them off and they break them. And because leprosy reduces our sensation. So in that regard, pain is probably pretty good. Pain extends our life. It lets us live longer. Uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's a good thing. But let me ask you another question. Now, what is the worst pain? Is it physical or emotional? Now, before you answer... Uh, 
there'd be arguments for both sides, physical or emotional. I was doing the funeral of a, of a dear friend, probably some people that are as close to my wife and I as anybody uh, in our life, and we we just lost her, and she went home quickly, and and her daughter came to me at the, after the funeral, and I said, how are you doing, hon? And she said, my heart hurts. And I thought, boy, that's a way to describe it. That says it. She said, uh, she just said, my heart hurts. And that's why emotional pain, it just makes you feel horrible as you lose someone. I have studied a little of this and understand, I think I understand why we hurt so bad when we lose somebody we love. And that is because love has two sides. Love is like a coin. It has heads and a tail. You, you love, the more you love someone or something, the more it hurts when you lose it. See, love is two-sided. And so when we love someone dearly, that means that the pain is going to be worse when we lose that person. Some people are acquaintances. You know them, but vaguely, when they die, you feel sorry about it, but you don't have, your heart doesn't hurt. But you lose somebody really close to you, and your heart hurts. So the more we love, remember that, the more we love, the more pain we've got coming when we lose that person. But what are we going to do? Not love? No. Shakespeare said, it is better to love and lost than to have never had love. He probably said it better than that, but you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> now, while we're there, while we're there, let me ask another hard question. Where does evil come from? Where does the evil come from? Does it come from God? Well, it can't come from God. I mean, now think about this a moment. Evil cannot originate in the heart of God because God is 100% pure and holy and good. There's not one piece of God that isn't good. So evil can't originate from Him. But as we know in the Garden of Eden, God created Adam and Eve, put them in a perfect place, perfect people, perfect place, perfect God. But in time, they rebelled against God and introduced evil into our planet. So evil comes when we rebel against God's leadership. That's where evil comes from. It's from, from rebellion. So, does God cause pain? I don't think God causes pain. But there has to be an answer to where it comes from. And so today we're going to take, we're going to pull back the curtain of eternity for a little bit today. We're going to look behind the, the stage. And we're going to see uh, what goes on in heaven just a little bit. Now this is very human language. Please understand this is Earth, earthly language, but if we're talking about heaven, but nevertheless, I think you can get it. Let's read chapter 2 and we'll pull the curtain back on eternity. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. Okay, so behind the scenes in eternity, we have God in heaven, and I see God seated, seated on a throne, high and lifted up. I see uh, angelic choirs singing and worshiping Him day and night. But we notice now that at a certain time, a bunch of angels came back from their job. They'd been sent on a mission. God said, I want you to go down to earth and do so and so. Go down to earth and find old so and so. Watch his name and, and take care of him. Watch him, you know, help him through this. So they got their, some of them had finished their work on earth and they were reporting back to God. So they were standing at attention before the Lord, you know, reporting in for duty, telling what they had done. <clears throat> and they looked around and there was somebody else there beside them that was, his name was Satan, the Lucifer. He's an angel. By the way, did you know the devil is an angel? Yeah, and he came back and he reported into God. I love this as I read behind the scenes just a little bit here. If you'll notice, nobody talks until God asks them a question. I mean, this is God you're talking to, right? You know, you shut up till it's time till He asks you a question. And so, and the Lord says, and to Satan, He said, oh, where do you come from? It's like, what are you doing here? Where'd you come from? And then He said, well, I've been down on your earth. I've been roaming around down there. Roaming around like a roaring lion looking whom I, I may devour is what it says in the New Testament. But it says, I've been going forth in it. And so here he is asked the question. God says, what are you doing here and where have you come from? But I think we notice here that Satan is patrolling planet Earth. By the way, he still is today. 
He's here this morning. <laughs> Whether we like it or not. I believe that God's here and in the form of the Holy Spirit. Because some of His people are here. And everywhere God's people show up, God shows up with the Holy Spirit. But I also think evil is here. And we have, once in a while, we encounter a little bit of that uh, here at, 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 on earth. And so we believe the devil is here, patrolling planet earth. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? He said, you, you see, Job, there's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. So we notice then that God reaffirms what He said about Job in chapter 1. In chapter 1 He said, Job's di different. There's nobody else down there like him. He's unique. In all the earth, Job is a unique guy. He said that about somebody else too. Remember who it was? Noah. Noah was, was perfect in his generations. There was nobody else like Noah. And God used Noah, of course we know, to uh, bring the human race over the flood. And start, let us start again. But the, we see here in the man of Job, we see a really good guy. One of the best ever that's lived on the earth. <clears throat> now Job, as I said, was different than everyone. who He lived his whole life to please the Lord. Job lived to please God. Every, I mean, and in a world when there was nothing else like that going on, he was different. He was special. That challenges me, and I hope it does you, to stand up and to love the Lord and to follow Him and to not be like the rest of the world, but to be that unique person. Let me talk a little bit here about the language God used to describe Job. He said, first of all, he's upright. What does that mean? He stands upright. Now you think, okay, big deal, I don't get it. What does that mean? Well, go back to the Garden of Eden, and when evil first showed up, it crawled on its belly. It didn't stand upright. It was slinking down horizontally on the ground. Now when God talks about Job, He says He is upright. In other words, He is different. He shuns evil. He's not like the snake in the garden. He's different. He stands up. He doesn't crawl. He's blameless. And He shuns evil and fears God. Well, Satan is thinking, you know, God, uh, you like Job really a lot. And, and Job likes you a lot. But I think there's a reason for that. Job said, I think, it's, I think there's an ulterior motive. I think Job likes you because you've been so good to me. And if you stop being so good to Job, he'll turn. He'll be like everybody else. <clears throat> so let's keep reading. Verse 4. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he'll surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he's in your hands, but you must spare his life. Now that's important. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Skin for skin. Uh... Life is an important gift that you, sh you have this morning. You have been given one of the most precious gifts on planet Earth, and it's called life. We need to live that life aware of how precious it is, how aware of how unique it is, because a lot of people we know a lot have gone on. They don't have their lives anymore. We live. This is our day, our time. We get to walk around upright on planet Earth today. We, we should remember that. And... and uh, and enjoy it and rejoice about it. I'm rejoicing this summer about with good health. Last summer I didn't have good health. I could barely, I woke, I'd hobble in here and preach and then go home and lay back down and spend the rest of my time in bed because I had a broken back. But I've had surgery and it's all good. It couldn't be better. It's, in fact, it's so good. Yesterday when I mowed my yard, I went as fast as that mower would go. <laughs> Just hit them bumps and jumped and woo, I didn't care. Let her go. <clears throat> I even outran my neighbor. Uh, it was, it's so good to have health. But see, we need to we realize how, how good it is to be living. How precious life is. How we enjoy it. Don't take it for granted. Don't be an old sourpuss moping around through life, sad and sorry about everything. Put a smile on your face. You're alive. You ain't dead yet. Amen? Come on. Let's, have, let's love this life. Okay. But, even though life is a precious gift, we're going to, we'll do about anything to save our own skin. So God said, or Job said, to, sorry, Satan said to God, God, you love Job, but you've and you've messed with him. You took away his material wealth and you took away his family, but now you you take away his health 
and he'll curse you. So, I, I don't think God wanted to do it, but he said, okay, well, you, you can do anything you want but spare his life. And so then Satan uh, put a horrible disease on Job and he began to suffer horribly, skin for skin, in other words, in his skin. <clears throat> So what did Jesus say about living, about life? I think it's important that we go there right now for just a moment. I want to run quickly to Matthew 16, verse 25, and talk about what Jesus said. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does that mean? Jesus means this. If you save your life, in other words, if you take your whole life and you use it exclusively for your pleasure, for your joy, for your comfort, and you, you, you gather your life around you, and you don't ever give it to anybody else. You gather it just to you. Jesus says, if you do that, you've lost it. But if you live and you lay your life down for others, you share it with others, you live for somebody else for another time. In other words, if you live other than... Then He says, you found your life. You have it. So today, some of you might want to take a clue from that. Mm -hmm. If you've been living your life just for you, you haven't got much of a life. You've lost it. But when you give it away, when you share, when you love, then you get your life back. Philippians 1.20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or whether by death. So we've got to remember that the love of to love the Lord and to share our life with others and give credit to Him. <clears throat> I want you to catch one thing here that we need to talk about before we go. I take great comfort in the fact knowing that the Lord is the one that gets to say when my life is over. Amen. Not the devil. Amen. He doesn't get to say when my life is over. He said, Joe, de devil, you go down there and you can give Job some sickness. But you can't take his life. That's mine. I'm, I'm the fat lady that's going to sing at the end of this opera. I mean, he's, you're not going to take his life. I'm the one that's going to say when. Aren't you glad God gets to say when? God says when. The devil don't say when. He can, the devil can hurt us. He can mess with us. He can get, make us sick. He can take things away from us. But only God holds our life in His hand. So... When God's done with you here, you're done. I don't care how many vitamin pills you take. You're going to be home with the Lord. So, be blessed by that. Health is a blessing. Oh, what a blessing. And the loss of health is a great sorrow. And you know that. But neither condition reflects our true spiritual condition. Let me explain. Some people think, I'm healthy, strong, young, and so therefore, I must be spiritually strong and powerful. No correlation. They don't connect. Some people think, I'm sickly and weak, so I must not be spiritually very strong. No. No correlation. Our physical does not co correlate to our spiritual. So don't get to thinking just because you've been blessed. You're wealthy and you're rich and you're healthy. Don't get to thinking that God likes you any more than others or that He likes you especially because that's no, there's no correlation there. All right? And, and again, it works for the other way. If you're sick, don't, don't think God's mad at you. He can be strong in that. So <clears throat> health is a blessing. But remember, it doesn't reflect our true spiritual condition. Now let me keep going. When we're in pain, when we're laying down and everything's hurting, and, or we're emotionally hurt, we've lost someone, that's the time we ask ourselves the very hard questions. That's the time we don't sweep things under the rug. That's when we get to, to the brass tacks of life. Why is this going on? Why Is pain good or is it bad? Is God in control or is He not? Is, is, is God evil or is the devil evil? We get down and we ask the very hard questions when we're in those difficult situations. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk now at the rest of my sermon. I'm going to talk about what are the hardest things about suffering. What are the very worst things about suffering? Here we go. Number one. And the question is, is we have this nagging doubt about the love of God. We have, we have this nagging doubt. God, do you really love me by letting this happen to me? 
do you really love me? Because if you really love me, wouldn't my life be like this? Instead of like it is? Or would that person wouldn't have died if you really loved me? Because you know how much I love that person. You wouldn't have let that person go out of my life. Or you wouldn't let my spouse divorce me or leave me. You know, or you wouldn't let my resources drain away to nothing. In other words, God, do you really love me? Are you taking good care of me? And that's a question that we'll all ask often, and especially in the hard times, if God loves me. Now let's read verse 7 and see if this explains. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Who went out from him? Satan. And afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Does God love me? Does God hurt me? Does God cause this pain? No, it wasn't God that caused the pain. It wasn't God. It wasn't God. God allowed it. He didn't stop it. But he, he, he allowed it to happen because He knew that in this and through this and because of Job's suffering, each of us today, if nothing else, each of us today will have this great lesson that, that, that's left here in the book of Job that God loves us and cares for us. And we don't know what's going on behind the curtain all the time. All right, let's, let's remember that. Now, the next thing I think that's so hard about pain is that we have a temptation to obsess over it and worry about it. Anybody else ever do that? I mean, you get sick and you go, oh, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. I mean, I, no matter, my wife will tell you, if I get a hangnail, it's the worst thing that ever happened to me. You know, it's horrible. I would just, I think it's men that do that. Isn't it? Anyway, they said, you want to you try having the baby? By the way, if men had to have the babies, there wouldn't be any more human rights. So. We'd be done. That's what people told me. I never had one. <laughs> Nagging questions or, or, or worry over pain. Now here's where this beautiful verse, not beautiful in that sense of lovely, but beautiful in the, the sense that it, it speaks so clearly and paints a picture. He said, verse 8, Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Whoa. Is that a picture or what? I mean, do I need to say any more about that? I mean, you could just see this man sitting there among the ashes. He didn't know what else to do. So he's just scraping the oozing sores on his body with a piece of pottery with a blank look on his face. I think he's staring out into space, not seeing anything. He's just sitting there among the ashes, worrying over what's going on in his life. Hmm. What do you think when your life goes to hell in a handbasket? What do you think? What do you worry about? What do you do? How do you handle it? Are you worried about what am I going to do next? Where, where am I going to go? Is God going to take care of me? How's this going to work when life is just going to hell? How do you cheer yourself? Well, remember the story in the New Testament about the rich man and Lazarus? The, the poor man. He, he was sitting there and the dogs licked his sores. He didn't know what to do. But if you see the end of the story, you know what to do. what's it coming. There's a better day coming. There's a better world. Job broke off a piece of pottery and scraped his boils. So let me give you some help. If you ever find yourself sitting among the ashes, here's what I want you to remember. Try to remember this. Remind yourself that God is good. Just say to yourself, I don't understand it, but God is good. This is not good sitting among the ashes. But God is good. Remind yourself. And it might not hurt to sing a verse or two of Great is Thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions. They fail not. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. That'll help you. That'll help you. Just remember how faithful God is. And remember that in all things, God works together for good to them that loves the Lord. So the next time you're sitting among the ashes, remember God is good. And that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. That doesn't mean all things are good, but you put them together with life and it works together for good. And then there's another thing that's really bad about pain. This is a little humorous, but it is true. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. And that is dealing with people's good intentions. 
and their counsel. You don't want to pay a lot of attention to what people tell you when you're sitting in the ashes. Because they have no idea what it feels like sitting in the ashes. Or they don't know what pain you're going through when you're sitting there scraping your boils. So don't pay attention. Let's keep reading here. And we're going to meet his wife. Job's wife's going to show up now. She's going to be a lot of help, right? No. <laughs> no. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? You old fool. Do you still trust God? Do you still believe God is good? Look at you, you old fool. I just hear her saying that over <laughs> Curse God and die. Just give up on Him. Mm -hmm. so, okay, but you're, you're hearing it. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Amen. Like, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So he said it right. I don't know what he thought, but I know what he said. It was always good. Can we, can God, is God just going to give us all good things? He's not. He's, but sometimes we're going to have some trouble. <clears throat> sometimes those people closest to us can hurt us the worst. Mm -mm. That's true, isn't it? Sometimes I, I, we're just not good counselors. When somebody's really close to us is struggling, we, we don't say the right thing sometimes. <clears throat> I, I've discovered with my life, this is just how I try it. When someone asks me directly, how are you doing? I try to describe my pain without exaggerating or a lot of drama. That's just me. Try to keep it, you know, here's this. And then I want to always quickly reaffirm my faith in God by saying, I love the Lord and I believe He's good. I want, it, I want that to come out quickly. Yeah, I'm hurting. This is tough. I don't like sitting in the ashes. But, but this is tough. But God's good. In all things, God's working together for good and my faith still holds. So quickly tell somebody that when they ask you how you are. Now, when you go to try to help somebody else, there are some other things you need to know. Let's keep reading. We're going to meet some guys now that are that are three of Job's friends. We met his wife. Now we're going to meet his friends, and they're going to they're going to counsel him. Verse eleven: When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, he was a little short guy. <laughs> Shuhite, <laughs> right? Okay. He was short. <clears throat> Let me keep going. I may, have, I may have stretched out a little bit. <laughs> when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all the, the, all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on... Get this now. Imagine this happening in our culture today. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. In our culture today, you can't wait ten seconds between in a conversation. If it, ten seconds go by, we just go nuts, don't we? We've got to say something. Fill the air with verbiage or whatever. But... But seven days and seven nights they sat on the ground with Job. Him in the ashes, scraping his boils, and those three friends sitting there with him. They didn't say a word. Wow! What a beautiful picture of love and sympathy and care. Imagine that. In our, again, com contrast that with our world today. Let me say to you that often we don't know how to deal with people who are hurt. I found that out to be true in my, in my life recently. Uh, people with the best intentions will say things, they, they don't think it through, they just say it, and, and it doesn't help. In fact, it makes it worse. Oh, I know how you feel. No, you don't know how I feel. You haven't been in my shoes. You don't know how I feel. <clears throat> when my dad died, uh, people with good intentions, they'd come up and they'd say, well, he's in a better place. Well, yeah, he's in a better place, but he's not in my place. And, uh, he's probably singing in Heaven's Choir. Well, yeah, he's probably singing in Heaven's Choir. But I'd like to sing with him here at the Cowboy Church. I miss getting to sing with him here. Uh, God needed him more in Heaven than you did. Well, they forgot how much we needed him here. See, be careful what you say. 
Take a lesson from those three guys. They did it right. They sat by Job seven days and seven nights and didn't say anything. What did they say? They With their presence, they were there in body. They said, we love you and our lives. We're going to put it on hold for seven days. We're going, to, we're going to stop what we're doing. And that should say to you a whole lot. And boy, it does. So when somebody's hurting, show up. Be there with them. But don't get lost in language. Because if you say something, you're probably going to say the wrong thing anyway. You know what I found? I really, I just got so simple. Longer I've been doing this preacher business. Is I just say, I love you. That's all. I love you. Because that's what I truly do. But Because anything else I said would, it wouldn't help. Be careful what you say when somebody's hurting. You don't have to say anything, first of all. Did you think about that? I know that's going to take a lot of pressure off of you. Because a lot of times, you know, you want to go be with people when they're hurting. Don't worry about what you say. Don't say anything. It's fine. Just be there. You're there, sitting in the circle. Just be there. That says it all. Say little, love much. Because when you when people know that what that you care, that's all that matters. That you care. So we're all going to have our time sitting in the ashes. You will. Some of you probably haven't yet, but a lot of you have. So when you find yourself scraping your boils, sitting in the ashes, staring off into space, just remember. God loves you. Even if it doesn't seem like it at all. Even if it seems like He's mad at you, turned against you. It's not true. And remember, worry is a waste of time. <laughs> now, thinking about what to do and how to get going and, and letting the Lord lead you, that's good. But worrying, waste of time. Doesn't help a thing. And remember this. People mean well, even when, when they say stupid things. Right? They mean well. So trust their heart. And here's the thing we need to do now from this point forward in your life to prepare you for the day that you're either sitting in the ashes or visiting someone sitting in the ashes. Here's what you do. Grow, develop, find a faith and grow it and develop it that will stand testing, that will stand up when you're sitting in the ashes. Grow a faith that's that strong that will get you through and then learn how to be a real support for those people who are hurting. I pray today that you know the Lord, the King of kings, the God who gives Satan his orders as well as his angels who, who keeps Satan in control and who runs the universe and loves you and cares for you and died for you on the cross. I hope you know Him today because He loves you more than you could imagine. You can't imagine how much He loves you. So get to know Him and then grow a faith in Him that stands the test of time. Father, come.